Good morning. Welcome back to Lent like no other. It just keeps going on that way, it seems, doesn't it? This, this Lenten season just seems about as long as one could imagine. But we'll find peace in it. And I know that we started off the day here in Wisconsin with a, a, a note from the governor to everyone in the state that non-essential businesses will be closed down as of tomorrow. I can assure you I will be here tomorrow. Uh, you can tune right into this and we'll continue to do this because whether we are considered a business or, or not uh, may be debatable, but it is not debatable as to whether or not we're essential. The word is essential, especially in times like these. And I assure you that the word will never be vanquished. So today, <clears throat> the uh, word for today is peace. What a fitting word for a day when we get an announcement like that. I was inspired to use this word today by just listening to the Eagle song, Peaceful, Easy Feeling. Probably just me saying that would just trigger that, that song in your mind of how it sounds, how it does bring on sort of that peaceful, easy feeling. But what we're going to do today is talk a little bit more about how we take it further than just being a feeling and to really actually make it an action. So with that, we'll start our opening prayer. And as you recall, if you have your prayer book, we begin that on page 80 of the Book of Common Prayer. And as we're praying and as we're talking and reflecting and having some readings, you may want to think of someone or some group of people that are really in need of peace today. And go ahead and use the chat function on this broadcast to just tell us who those are. And when we come to our prayers for the people, we will include them. Thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place and also with the one who has a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite. With that, we will begin. Lord, open our lips. And our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Come, let us adore him in the words of the Jubilate, which is on the following page, uh, page 82. We say this together. Be joyful in the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness and come before his presence with a song. Know this, the Lord himself is God. He himself has made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and call upon his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his faithfulness endures from age to age. You might remember from last week when we talked about grace, I pulled out the old dictionary of theological terms, good stuff uh, left over from seminary. I have to take it out once in a while when we really want to dig deeper into a word. We discovered last Friday that grace actually had 16 different definitions of different kinds of grace. With peace, we're going to only focus on two. The first one is just what is the definition of peace? And here's what it says. Fullness, well-being, translation of shalom, a Hebrew term used for both greeting and farewell with great richness of meaning. It is much more than lack of war and points to full societal and personal well-being, coupled with righteousness and possible only as a gift from God. Think of how active that that sounds. And I know that, you know, our culture tends to be uh, lean on the idea of the peaceful, easy feeling. But what this is really speaking to is an active invitation to share peace with one another. You often hear people use the word shalom. It's a marvelous word because it really is an active invitation, isn't it? 
And when one says it to the other, then we have a sharing of the peace. We do that each time we have the Eucharist. And unfortunately for this time, we have to suspend that. We're essentially on a fast from the Eucharist, you might say. But each time we celebrate the Eucharist, we always have an exchange of the peace prior. It is a shalom. It is a fullness that we strive for. That's very, very important before we share in the body of Christ. And there is a reading that really was not too long, long ago that we had this when we had the, bless, uh, the Beatitudes in Matthew. Matthew says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. And also in Matthew, we learn that how important it is that we do exchange that peace and that we do it earnestly before we partake in the holiest of sacraments. In Matthew, we hear Jesus say, but I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable in judgment. He goes on later to say, so when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. So before we offer that shalom, as we gather around the Lord's table, that we want to shed ourselves of the burden of that conflict. When I look at the last number of years, particularly since 2016, it seems that there's an awful lot of anxiety and conflict among people. I was really tremendously saddened at the end of the results of the 2016 election, for example, to find out how many people had multi-decade relationships, 40 and 50 years, and that they were dissolved because of an outcome of an election. Think about how lacking in the fullness of peace that that really is. Think about how much Jesus is calling each of us when we find ourselves in that position to go and make peace. In this time when we are kind of shuttered up, hunkered down, as we say, it'd be a great opportunity to pick up a phone call or pick up a phone and make a call. Maybe to write a card or a letter to someone that you maybe feel ill at ease with, that, that the friendship or the family relationship may have been broken in ways, and that offer your shalom, offer that peace. And peace doesn't come easy for us, but it does come easy for God. And that's why we close our Eucharistic prayers with a blessing that says that the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his son, Jesus Christ. Because you see, if we keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, then we're inspired to share peace, to say shalom. So with that... I picked a psalm today that really reflects that sense of peace. It's not the one appointed for today, but sometimes I think it's good that we just go with what really reflects what we're focused on. And the psalm is Psalm number 91. And you can find Psalm number 91 on page 719 of the prayer book. We'll take a moment of silence while you turn to the page to just take in the idea of peace We'll go ahead and say this psalm responsively. I'll start with the first line, and then you can join in with the other line. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High abides under the shadow of the Almighty. He shall say to the Lord, you are my refuge and my stronghold, my God in whom I put my trust. He shall deliver you from the snare of the hunter and from the deadly pestilence. He shall cover you with his pinions, and he shall find refuge under his wings. His faithfulness shall be a shield and a buckler. You shall not be afraid of any terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day. Of the plague that stalks in the darkness, nor of the sickness that lays waste at midday. 
a thousand shall fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Your eyes have only to behold, to see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your refuge and the most high your habitation. There shall no evil happen to you. Neither shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. They shall bear you in their hands, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the adder. You shall trample the young lion and the serpent under your feet. Because he is bound to me in love, therefore will I deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I am with him in trouble. I will rescue him and bring him to honor. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. You can hear the sense of assurance, even in great danger, that the psalmist writes. There's so many psalms that really reflect that human anxiety, that human strife, and even fear. But then there's these assurances that the Lord is with us. But we have to focus on what really does make peace. And that brings me to the second definition that I wanted to read to you. Um, and this is really taking it and making it active, making it a verb, not a noun. And that would be the word peacekeeping. But peacekeeping is defined this way. A view of the task of Christian churches that pursues the biblical vision of peace as eschatological, as linked with justice, as communal and personal, a divine gift and human task, and as requiring witnesses and agents. See how active that is, that in seeking peace, that it's communal, it's active, it's inviting, it's sharing. So often we think when we kind of hope for peace, that it's something that comes from the outside. But the truth is that it comes from within, that we have to be at peace with God and at peace with ourselves before we can really reach out with a genuine shalom, don't we? I found an interesting little story online that talks about that concept of really reaching within to find peace and not counting on it to come from another place. Here's how this goes. It's called One Day the Most Peaceful Inhabitants from the Earth. And I found it online and I don't really know who wrote it, or I would certainly give them credit for that. One day, the most peaceful inhabitants from the earth asked one very powerful wizard to stop all wars and bloodshed on the planet. Oh, it is simple, he said. I will destroy all weapons on earth and nobody will be able to fight anymore. Oh, it would be great, the people exclaimed. The magic wand was waved and this was done. There was, pe there was a peace on the planet for three days. While the majority of those who were prone to fight sought and could not find a weapon, they understood that they had lost it forever. Then they have made spears out of young trees and started to fight again. When the wizard heard this bad news, he said, do not worry, I will destroy all the young trees so that they will not be able to fight. After two or three days of useless search for young trees suitable to make spears, the rebellious people started to cut down giant trees and make battens for them. And then the bloodshed had started again. The wizard destroyed all the big trees. Then humans made knives and swords out of metal. He destroyed all the metal on the planet. People made slings and ma began to throw stones at each other. It was necessary to destroy the stones too. And then the peacemakers began to worry. All of the trees have disappeared. There's no metal and stones. How to live? What to eat now? There will be no vegetation soon. And people will die without even fighting. No, this is a wrong solution for the problem. The wizard became very confused. I don't know how to behave now. I would have destroyed all humanity, but unfortunately it's not in my power. The peacemakers fell into despair. They did not know what to do. 
And then one clever child turned to the wizard. I know what you should do. Let people feel how others perceive their actions. If one person hurts someone, let him feel that same pain. And if he brings joy to someone, let him feel the same joy. So no one will hurt each other because he will feel the pain immediately too and would have to stop. All the people were inspired with the greatness of the child's thought and the wizard realized his idea. He returned all the trees and the stones and the metals. Since that day, no one on the planet tried to hurt his neighbor because he would have to feel the same pain too. People began to help each other because they liked the sense of joy that they felt at this moment. And they began to live in harmony and joy. That's kind of a fantastical tale, but I think it has a real point to it, doesn't it? That we have to reach inside for real genuine peace. Because in, in the absence of that, what we substitute it with is blame for others for things not being peaceful. I would submit to you during this time when we're struggling through a virus, a viral outbreak, that it's a time for us to really nestle into the idea of what it is that I do that can help to bring peace rather than waiting for the other to do it or even an outside source that no one can see. For the truth is that if we all carried shalom in our heart, then it wouldn't be just a greeting. It would be an active way of life. So today's biblical reading is actually the daily office reading for yesterday. This is our daily office book that we use. But I thought that it was very pertinent to the notion of establishing and maintaining and sharing peace. This particular reading is from Romans. And the whole reading is, is uh, chapter 8, 11 through 25. But I'm going to read part of it because it is quite long. But I'm going to read the part that I think really, really captivates this idea. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies, also through his spirit that dwells in you. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And children then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If in fact we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. It really kind of points to the idea that establishing peace for us is not easy business. But if we really truly reach out to God in prayer and that we humble ourselves before God and with one another, that the spirit will move within us and things will be much different. It's a good time for us to consider that. He concludes the letter, this letter, uh, chapter 8, concludes with, For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it in patience. Peace is one of those things that we don't really see, but we can see the results of it. We can see what peace leads to. And if we make ourselves instruments of that peace, then we all collectively are one. There's a nice poem that I had seen as well. This one is by William Cowper, and it's entitled Joy and Peace. It goes like this. 
Sometimes a light surprises the Christian while he sings. It is the Lord who rises with healing on his wings. When comforts are declining, he grants the soul again a season of clear shining to cheer it after rain. In holy contemplation, we sw sweetly then pursue the theme of God's salvation and find it ever new. Set free from present sorrow, we cheerfully can say, e'en let the unknown tomorrow bring with it what it may. It can bring it with it nothing, but he will bear us through. Who gives the lilies clothing will clothe his people too. Beneath the spreading heavens, no creature but is fed. And he who feeds the ravens will give his children bread. Though vine nor fig tree neither, their wanted fruit shall bear. Though all the fields should wither, nor flocks nor herds be there. Yet God the same abiding, his praise shall tune my voice. For while in him confiding, I cannot but rejoice. We'll make a copy of that available to you. If you like, you can email us and we'll email it back to you. But think about that idea of abiding in God's love and peace. It's really the first step, isn't it? It goes right along with the first command to love God with all of our strength, our soul, our mind, and spirit. Well, we are seeking peace when in fact we're doing that. I ask you to think about making it personal. What, what can you do in this quiet time, so to speak, to advocate for peace, not in a political way, but in a personal and spiritual way? What can we do to really share peace? We're doing it in part by having our collection here we still invite everyone to come by and, and set some food or some paper products or personal products or whatever into the bins outside of our church. It'll be there from 10 till three. And then we'll take that down and we'll make sure that it is shared with the people that are the most vulnerable among us. And sometimes seeking out peace means that we have to go a great distance to do it. So we have to step outside of our comfort zone and indeed our walls, and bring peace to people who may have tremendous anxiety. And with that gift of food or articles of great need, it's indeed a wonderful way to say shalom. So let us have our prayers talk about who it is that we're praying for today. And our prayers continue on page 97 of the Book of Common Prayer. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Show us your mercy, O Lord. And grant us your salvation. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. Let your people sing with joy. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world. For only in you can we live in safety. Lord, keep this nation under your care. And guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let your way be known upon earth. Your saving health among all nations. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten. Nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God. And sustain us with your Holy Spirit. This is a colic for peace that is actually embedded in our morning prayer. O God, the author of peace and lover of concord, to, to know you is eternal life and to serve you is perfect freedom. Defend us, your humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in your defense, may not fear the power of any adversaries through the might of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified, receive our supplications and prayers which we offer before you for all members of your holy church, that in their vocation and ministry they may truly and devoutly serve you through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I ask your prayers today for a number of people, and I am so delighted that we have so many people tuning in and so many people that we lift up prayers for. We lay our anxieties at the altar, make peace with one another, and a lot of that is done by lifting up prayer, including prayer for our enemy. We pray today for Claire, Brian, Christine, Libby, Deborah, Missy, Diana, Pam, Jim, Dan, Ruth, Nancy, Andres, Elizabeth, John, Nance, Nels, Julie, Jenny, Will, Helen, Rick, Tony, Polly, Anne, Heidi, George, Connor, Anita, Cooper, Fred, Bob, Leon, Rachel, Joe, Tommy, Jerry, Joni, Mrs. Mullen, Virginia, Caroline. Pray for also for our health care workers, our military, our leaders working day and night for containment, for cure, and for peace. We pray for teenagers that are home, that they may stay close to God and not get lost without structure or school or in person, that they take this time to also be at peace. For those with OCD and anxiety, that they may be relieved as much of their fear as possible. And indeed, we lift that prayer up for all people who struggle emotionally, spiritually, that find themselves being enveloped with fear, that the notion of loving peace of God would unravel that for them take that burden away from them. We pray for government that they may make difficult decisions with peace of God and not fear. And indeed, we beseech the Lord to fill all leaders with his heavenly benediction and grace and with wisdom and judgment and understanding that they may serve the people in a way that brings peace about them and peace with our God. Amen. Today, I'd like to close with another collect for peace. And you can find this on page 825 of the prayer book. And I invite you to look through the prayer book for a great many prayers and collects that really can give a lot of great comfort. Sometimes we find ourselves pinned down with the prayer book to only use it for a service or two that we uh, do weekly. But really, the prayer book is a gem of all kinds of wonderful information. It has all of the Psalms, and the Psalms uh, really echo a lot of our life and our appeal to God in this case today, our appeal for peace. Eternal God, 
in whose perfect kingdom no sword, no sword is drawn, but the sword of righteousness. No strength known, but the strength of love. So mighty spread abroad your spirit, that all peoples may be gathered under the banner of the Prince of Peace, as children of one Father, to whom be dominion and glory now and forever. Amen. That's a real definitive note of peace, isn't it? And today, we'll close also with a reading from Numbers, very familiar to the ear, that the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. And with that, blessings on your day. I'll see you again tomorrow at 10.